we're naturally, it's the, it's the automatic record. All right, people are coming in. Fantastic, thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a couple minutes when our numbers kind of settle. I see a lot of folks joining all at once. Welcome in. Everybody's early today. <laughs> Welcome in, we'll get started in just a minute. All right, folks, welcome in, get settled. We'll get started here right at, well, it's noon now, so maybe we'll give it another minute as people still keep coming in. Fantastic. So I'll go over um, a brief intro of Linda and our program and what we're going to be talking about today in just a moment. Thank you, Jane. Being early because the talks are so interesting, we don't want to miss a minute. We love to hear that. All right, our numbers are slowly starting to settle, so we're going to get started here. Um, if you've been to our talks before, this is going to be a little review of, of how you can utilize the Zoom space um, to better maximize your um, interaction. Um, we're going to be talking for uh, about an hour. Our, our program is scheduled for noon to one. Um, and we're going to be able to answer some of your questions at the end of Linda's presentation today. She'll be sharing her screen and showing um, some photos and documents from the collections of the San Diego History Center and talking about um, her topic for that period of time. While she's talking, you are welcome to use the Q&A function, that Q&A box there for a specific question about the content or about our programs, our offerings, anything you want to ask Linda or me about the History Center or about life on the home front in World War II. You can also use the chat function if you wanna share a story, a connection, say hi to us or anything you wanna share out there, um, you're welcome to use the chat function for that. But try and include your questions in the Q&A function so we don't miss them because um, the chat can get pretty busy and I don't want to miss out on your question and not be able to answer it. Um, we're going to have Linda be uh, in, starting in just a moment. We've got a few more people just come in. Um, so please use that Q&A function for any questions you've got for her or about the History Center in general and use that chat function just to say hi or share something um, that's a connection to something that she's sharing. Um, we are here at San Diego 101, part of our um, webinar series here. We've got a wonderful topic for you today. And if you have been here um, over and over in the past few months, you may notice that we are completing our series now. So Linda got started with us um, with San Diego during World War I a few months ago. And then we saw San Diego between the wars. And now we are here with San Diego um, during World War II. So if you are waiting for this story to keep going, welcome back. <laughs> and if you've been with us you know, over the last few months, you're probably familiar with how this goes. Um, we're going to be sharing a lot of San Diego history, lots of stories, lots of connections, and lots of visuals with you. So um, please ask any questions you've got in that Q&A, share any stories you've got in that chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, especially big shout out to our uh, members and donors who make this possible, this free series possible for all of us. Um, we are now open, so you can visit us in person. We're open here at the History Center in uh, Balboa Park, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 11 to 4. Um, we're open at the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 11 to 4. So do come visit us. Those are going to be our hours and days open through Labor Day. Um, and we'd love to see you. 
Um, we are going to continue this webinar series, San Diego 101, on our second Tuesdays at noon. So this will keep going. Um, you know, even though we're open, we want to continue to be able to offer this way uh, to folks who can't make it to us or who want to interact with us in a different way. So definitely keep your eyes peeled um, and check out our events page and keep an eye on your emails for those upcoming topics and specific dates and links to join us. Um, and without anything further from me, I'm going to um, let Linda get started with our topic for today, San Diego during World War II. Everybody and welcome back. If you've seen me before, um, I hope you've enjoyed the talks. And um, as Sam said, this is the last of a series of three. And there's kind of squishy borders between these talks because actually the photo that uh, that you see now is an image of San Diego taken in the late 1930s. And you might know how, how can we date it? Well, if you look in this kind of the center of the picture, here's Balboa Park. And you see, can see some of the improvements made for the 1935 exposition that was held there. So we know it's later than 1935. Um, going down Sixth Avenue uh, into the downtown area, down Broadway, we see changes to the bay that happened. This uh, large white triangular area is a result of dredge materials brought up from the bottom of the bay to create a big parking lot by the ferry terminal that was operational starting in about 1937. So all along the bay, you see the results of the dredging and the building up of the shoreline. Uh, here's the area where the convention center is today and some of our big resort hotels. Uh, in this area where the, where the fishing boats came in and the canneries were there. And then further south, you have some of the, the shipyards um, of the national city area. But what's that up in the air? There's some planes up there and we very proudly produced these in San Diego at a place called, at the time, Consolidated Aircraft. And it was brought into San Diego by a man named Reuben Fleet starting in 1935. Uh, they were producing planes here. And this one is the PBY Catalina with a, its very distinctive tail here. Um, at any rate, so this was a flyover for the benefit of the people of San Diego, I'm sure. Um, so this is getting you oriented to what we're talking about before San Diego and, and the country actually got involved in World War II. You see, with fleet here in 1935 and producing aircrafts, uh, aircraft for the Allies over in Europe, um, we were very much aware of what was going on over there. And uh, it was causing a lot of people to move into San Diego for these wartime jobs. Remember, this is just the end of the Great Depression. Um, President Roosevelt allocated a lot of funds to build the buildings in Balboa Park. He gave money for some of the improvements along the Bayfront. And so you have a lot of strangers coming into town. In fact, um, just be, uh, about 1940, Consolidated had about 17,000 workers 80% of whom were new to San Diego. So it's incredible incoming uh, group of people coming into work in San Diego in the aircraft industry. There are only about 38,000 people in the military here at that point, but that number obviously is going to grow very quickly because on December 7th of 1941, with the Japanese attacking the bases at Pearl Harbor, immediately our country gets drawn into the, uh, the conflict. And so now we have a war that's taking place on two sides of our country uh, and San Diegans are all of a sudden very, very interested. Now, my talk is not gonna be about the ships and the battles and where people went and how they got there. It's more about what was happening on the home front when these things were occurring. So for example, on the day that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, as it turned out, it was the radio station at Point Loma which was the, the station which was spreading the news to the rest of the country because the radio station was down um, in, in Honolulu. So, so that's one link we have to what's going on over there. But also you have the people here in San Diego and how did they react to what's going on? Looking at the oral history transcripts in our collection at the San Diego History Center, um, there are many stories related to World War II uh, one young woman had young children and lived in it. She said it was a tiny house on Mission Beach. 
And she and her husband took the kids, sat on a blanket that night, and were waiting for the Japanese to come over to San Diego. Scary thoughts. Uh, another woman named Barbara Jones, and some of you may have known her. She was very active in the San Diego Floral Association. She was the editor of the first book of Kate Sessions' writings that was excerpted from their newsletter. And Barbara Jones was a, uh, a maybe freshman or sophomore at San Diego State College at that point, it was called, lived in La Jolla Shores. And her family became aware by the telephone and by what was happening on the radio. They knew about the bombing at Pearl Harbor, but it became very real to them when she and her mom got up to fix breakfast the next morning. They're dressed in their bathrobes. They go out to the kitchen, which is at the back of the house. They look out the window and there in their backyard are some military men who overnight have built a little watch station with radio connections. And so the war came to them very quickly and very abruptly. So lots of little stories like these about what it was like. At Consolidated, they were still building planes 24 hours a day. And when the military showed up and said, hey, we are now at war and you've got to stop production, basically the supervisors refused. And so the military just disconnected the electricity. Same exact thing happened over in Tijuana with some of the military things that were happening over there. So, um, you know, the country took um, uh, sort of a, in some ways, a slow uh, approach to understanding what this was really going to mean to the day-to-day -day life of people in San Diego. Barbara Jones, by the way, immediately went downtown to volunteer and she was one of the volunteers that was a tracker um, before the military could get enough people assigned to tracking uh, flights that were headed to, from, across San Diego, it was these volunteers who used big maps and pointers. You've seen it in the in the uh, movies sometimes of the, of the spotters that were spotting where these planes were coming in. Well, the Japanese attack. Um, there was already in San Diego a lot of military construction going on, but with the attack, there were all of a sudden thousands of people coming to San Diego, both to work in the aircraft plants and the military ramped up significantly. Now, up in the area that today we call the area Linda Vista, and this project was known as the Kearney Mesa Housing Project. This was a project that was begun in the hills above the General Dynamics plant, even before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So in the late 1930s, uh, it was starting to be occupied in 1940, 41. This huge complex was built and the builders were charged with building 3000 houses in 300 days. Now this is a Mesa that is completely without any infrastructure at all. So they had to clear the land bring in the water, bring in sewer pipes, string electricity, and then they could actually start carving out the roads and then finally bringing in the materials to build the houses. Just to give you an idea of where it's located, down below here, this S curve coming up and into the middle of the property, uh, that is Linda Vista Road. Um, up here, the road changes its name and becomes Convoy. And this little angular road off to the side is uh, Genesee. So here's the confluence of those three, and this is the community of Linda Vista. So how do you build 3,000 houses in 300 days? And the answer is that you do it in a production line, just like they built the cars at the Ford Company plant. So the first group of workers came in, well, how about this? How about talking about the last group of workers that came in? So the houses are up. They've been built one by one by one as a production line moves through. Here's what the last group does. The first group of workers digs a hole. The second group of workers pours in fresh concrete. The third group of workers puts down a metal pole into the middle of that wet concrete, gets it secure. And the fourth group of window uh, workers strings the clotheslines between the houses that have been built. So that's how Linda Vista was built. Um, 3,000 in 300 days, they built 3,750 houses in 159 days, which housed eventually 14,000 people. 
just in this one little compound up on the hillside, up above the college. And when I say the college, that college was not there at, the, at that point, but it was the University of San Diego and also above the plant at, uh, at the General Dynamics plant. The, in the image down below, you can see people working, walking down a dirt road. They are not workers work, walking down the dirt road. They are workers who are walking from these completed houses and they are headed down to one of the two trolley stops that serves Linda Vista so that the people who could live there could get down to their jobs. Now you had to be qualified to live at this plant. You had to either be a member of the military or you had to be an electrical, a gas line worker, a utility worker. So these were necessary industries and those were who got the first choice to live in the community of Linda Vista. There was a lot of construction going on in San Diego, getting ready for all of these workers who were coming in. Um, this diagram shows the 1943 military and housing installations. Up at the top here is Camp Callan, which is built up um, on the cliffs overlooking uh, uh, La Jolla Bay. And this is approximately where the Salk Institute is located today. So you have Camp Callan, uh, the Marine Rifle Base, and then over here, another Marine facility, which was Camp Elliott. And between Camp Elliott, here is that con uh, convoy street leading down to the uh, Linda Vista housing community, and then down close to uh, where the construction of the planes was going on at Consolidated. But there were many other places uh, where people were living in quickly built housing. Here in Pacific Beach, uh, there were a thousand, what were called uh, a thousand to 1500 demountable housing units constructed. Um, and these were basically trailers. They were things that were not on solid foundations and so they could be quickly redeployed for other uses. So Pacific Beach had some, there were some um, small amount near Moreno Boulevard. There were some down near the Roar plant down in Chula Vista. So lots of temporary housing um, being built. Here's an aerial view of the Pacific Beach community, this demountable housing. So all of basically everything you see that's built in very straight lines and very complex is military housing in Pacific Beach. If you go driving the streets of Pacific Beach today, you'll still see some of this housing still standing. Now, something interesting to note about its location in Pacific Beach, right down this dark line is where the railroad lines ran and the line coming in this direction, this is Balboa Avenue. And this is one of two ways that the workers and the military people living in this housing could get down to either the, the consolidated plant or down to the military bases. Something to notice is that um, this canyon that you see, and actually you can spot it behind the hill and then there is an abrupt uh, right bend here. This is Rose Canyon. This is what Rose Creek comes down. And this dark area is Rose Creek. You can see on this photograph, some of the areas that Rose Creek used to flood. So before the military could build all this housing, they had to build some temporary uh, dams just to hold back Rose Creek, which then flowed into what was then Mission Bay. So that's where some of these many demountable units were constructed in Pacific Beach. Now, there were other units that were constructed over on Midway Avenue, over by where today's sports arena is. Um, the housing was called Frontier Housing, and it created an interesting situation for this military and governmental housing at, toward the end of World War II. You see, Japanese Americans had been removed from the coastal areas of California and sent to internment camps all up and down um, the middle of the country. Um, the ones here in San Diego were sent to a camp called Poston, just over the Colorado River in Arizona. When people from Poston were allowed to move back into San Diego, even before the end of the war in 1944, they could do so if they had a job to go to and a place to live. That's when Japanese Americans came up against the predominantly white community that was living in frontier housing. There was quite a bit of turmoil when the first buses of Japanese arrived from Arizona, hot, tired, dusty, and concerned themselves about what was going to happen 
uh, things were resolved. Uh, Japanese Americans settled in frontier housing. And in fact, uh, a fair number of our teenagers in um, uh, the community, people who were teenagers in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, graduated from high school at Point Loma High School. Well, lots of military around uh, from the late 1930s, really, there were a lot of military in town. Um, this is an image of Horton Plaza, not the shopping center, but the park located across the street. You can just make out the corner of uh, the, the US Grant Hotel. Uh, this is Broadway Street crossing it diagonally um, between the where the people are waiting for a bus and the US Grant Hotel. Here you can see one of the big uh, palm trees that runs along Broadway by this little park. I want you to keep this in mind. There were, there were a fair number of military around in these days, but the figure keeps getting bigger and bigger. Now, one of the men who came to town with the Navy um, in the early 1940s was a man named Jack Hall, and I had the opportunity to interview him by phone. He lives in Indiana now. And uh, Jack Paul came here, finished his training, and he was si assigned to the USS Bassett, who headed out into the Pacific. So this is now 1940, 44, 45, and um, their ship is out in the Pacific. They are dodging Japanese. They are trying to keep track of what's going on when all of a sudden they get a message in the middle of the night, an emergency, and they have to go rescue sailors from a, a, a sinking ship. The USS Indianapolis had sunk out by the Marianas Islands out in the South Pacific, and Jack Paul and his fellow sailors were part of the rescue detail, and they eventually um, rescued 157 sailors from that ship. The USS Indianapolis was important uh, because the Japanese sunk her after she had just delivered a very important piece of material to the Marianas. She is the one who uh, uh, dropped off the atomic bomb, which was later dropped on Hiroshima. So this is a story of Jack Paul. When sailors came to town in San Diego, uh, most of them went to a photography shop and had a, a, a picture taken for their mom. And some of them went back to the same shop and had a photo taken when they arrived back in San Diego and sent it to their mom as well. Um, Jack Paul remembers the beautiful sunsets. He remembers the beaches. He remembers the hillsides. He returned to Indiana and never came back to San Diego again. But he is typical of many of those people who either came out here during the military or um, during uh, working at the construction plants and they remembered San Diego and many of them came back to make it their home. Well, there were not, with all the men who were leaving to enter the military, there were not enough workers in the aircraft plants. And so the big question became, should your wife take a war job? And it wasn't only wives that were taking war jobs. It was also teachers, single women, who were been, being recruited to work the summers at the General Dynamics, pardon me, not General Dynamics by this time, Consolidated Aircraft Company, consolidated plant in San Diego. And so if you get a chance, there's a very interesting book. It's called Slacks and Calluses. It was written in 1944 by two women. Their last names are Reed, R-E-I-D, and Allen, A-L-L-E-N. They have a copy of it at the uh, San Diego Public Library. And in Slacks and Calluses, these two women wrote about their adventures of working for one summer at the Consolidated Air Aircraft Plant um, in San Diego. I highly recommend it if you wanna know more about the day-to-day -day lives of people who worked in the plant. So here in Consolidated, um, women made up 40% of the workforce at one point, a big shocker to the men who were able to stay and work in the plant. They were just simply not used to having these women around. It was difficult for the women as well uh, women's restrooms were far apart, um, and there were other things that weren't um, all that uh, all that pleasant for them as well. Um, here you can see them working, walking into the plant, and as you notice, there's a lot of women in the crowd here, and many of these women were wearing trousers, 
or slacks or other things which women of this day would hardly imagine wearing. Um, so this was a big uh, sea change, if you will. This was a big change in social culture was to have in, having these women wearing pants in order to go into work. And work they did 24 hours, uh, 24 hour shifts around the clock. In fact, Barbara Jones, the woman I referred to earlier, said that before the bombing at Pearl Harbor, San Diego was a pretty quiet community and the businesses all pretty much closed up five or six o'clock in the evening, maybe a little bit of activity downtown, but not much. She said, once the war workers were here and the military was here, we were a 24 hour a day and you could go any place and get a drink and get entertainment and be hosted by military men. And you could just have a lot of fun as a young single woman in San Diego. But this is, these are the women who are working at Consolidated. Um, here are some of the plant buildings at the lower right. There were a whole series of plant buildings. The first of them built in 1935, but then as the different types of aircraft um, were changed, um, they were building the Catalinas and the Coronados here in the early years. Then they switched over th to the B-24 bombers. Um, FDR was giving them production goals, which were just unbelievable in which they were meeting. Um, by the end of the war uh, in this plant, they had produced more than 10,000 aircrafts of various types from the late 1930s until the late 1940s. So a tremendous uh, production activity. Here in the plant grounds, you can see some of the camouflage that was developed in order to hide um, the fact that this was a huge factory complex from any Japanese who might come here for attack. And so here above uh, your head or the heads of the people working, you would see some of the camouflage netting. And this was basically a burlap into which they had uh, put mostly chicken feathers that had been gathered at the chicken farms and shipped in boxcars full to the place where these camouflage nets were made. Um, women did not like to draw, uh, uh, walk under the camouflage nets because not only were there chicken feathers dropping into their hair, but chickens have a way of leaving little things behind on the ground as they walk around. And so the chicken poop was dropping into their hair as well. So this was an area where the women tried to avoid if they could when they had to walk through the plants. Well, how did they get to work? Trolley cars were the main type of transportation here in San Diego. Not that many people had private cars. And to be honest, the roadways were jammed with the workers trying to get to the plants 24 hours a day from military trying to get to the military bases 24 hours a day. And so trolley lines and bus lines were probably the most efficient ways of getting around town. And yet they were not efficient at all. Something I want you to notice in this diagram, the very upper part, it shows the lines in La Jolla. Uh, then you have the trolley lines here in Pacific Beach, one coming down Morana Boulevard, the other coming down through the middle of Mission Bay. But look where they all end up. There are eight different trolley lines that all end up outside the doors of the consolidated aircraft plant. So can you imagine what shift change was like at this point in time? You have people coming off shift, waiting to take a trolley home. You have people coming on shift, trying to get out of the trolley so they can get into the plant. You have the few people who had their private cars who were able to park their very small lot just off site. And in fact, uh, today, as you drive down Pacific Highway, you can still see some of the bridges that were uh, created during World War II over Pacific Highway in order to get people from the plant buildings to the trolley car lines or to the parking lots where their cars were. Uh, very difficult place to get around. Um, here is the single trolley line that goes up to the 3,000 people living, three, pardon me, 3,000 homes, 14,000 people living up here at Linda Vista, only two stops in the entire community in order for them to come back down to work at Consolidated Aircraft or to change lines to move into other parts of the community which were also serviced by the trolley lines. So uh, a statistic that just blows my mind is at the, the bottom of this image, 
1945, there were more rides taken on the San Diego trolley and bus systems, more rides taken than there were people in the United States. So we just had a huge number of people trying to get around the community. Now with women going to work in the plants and going to work during times, either when their husbands may have been in the military and assigned to other places around the country, or um, in some cases, husbands and wives were working different shifts. And so it became very difficult to know what to do with your children, especially if you had come out to San Diego from someplace else in order to bring your family to get a good paying job. And so you didn't have any relatives, you were relying on friends to maybe help you take care of your children. And so one of our local organizations helped out. Uh, the San Diego Girl Scouts, which at the, at the time noted was located in buildings. Today, the area is known as the Pepper Grove and there is a large playground nearby. But this is where these buildings were located. And luckily, it was close to the trolley car lines that came up from the downtown area, or you could connect in. So women at any time of day could bring in their young children to stay in the Girl Scout camps, which were here on site. Now, mind you, this area is all been taken over by the military. So this is a relatively safe place to be uh, from for about seven and a half years, the military had control of the 1935 part of the park and the buildings in the 1915 part of the park as well. So when these buildings were finally vacated, they were in pretty sad shape because of all of the people who had gone through them over all the years uh, that they'd been under the military control. But I just wanted you to know that Girl Scouts played an important role in helping the women who were working um, in these camps. Now, there were a lot of jobs that were open to women who had never been open to women before. One of them was as a bus driver. And so here you've got a young woman in her uniform urging women to come and apply to, uh, apply to be bus drivers. Um, Japanese Americans who were working in the internment camps were given the opportunity to work uh, at facilities which were making things needed in the war effort. So this is a W-2 form from um, a local woman who, um, who did two different kinds of jobs in 1943. Uh, at one point she was working making those camouflage nets that were strung over places like the Consolidated Aircraft Facility. Um, and then the other thing that she did was she worked in a vegetable cannery in Utah and they were um, canning the vegetables that were then shipped off to the men who were working overseas. So her total earnings for 1943, total earnings were $170. Now we looked at a picture of Horton Plaza um, a little bit earlier and we saw, we were actually looking at this area here and we saw people waiting and mainly, sold, or pardon me, sailors in their Navy uniforms waiting for a bus. Um, but things got a lot busier at Horton Plaza as the war went on. So across the street, you can see the Horton, uh, the, I'm sorry, the US Grant Hotel. And um, you see that there are now bus lines. There are also trolley lines running down the middle of Broadway. So this is a huge center point for people trying to get uh, trolleys to their housing, to uh, come downtown to shop, to come downtown to work. Um, so transportation was very, very difficult downtown and, and Horton Plaza was the center point. Um, so it was a very crowded place to come downtown. Uh, lots of things being done out in the community to help with the war effort. Um, there was rationing, you can see a gas rationing uh, book here but also um, things that were required for, for daily living, sugar, flour, meat, coffee, all of those things were being sent overseas or put into products which were sent overseas to the military. And so the people on the home front were really um, uh, working hard to try and maintain a normal lifestyle. Um, Barbara Jones talked about how one of the very popular things for women to trade when they got together, the women who were at home, was a variety of 
uh, re recipes for making tomato ketchup because you couldn't get tomato ketchup. You had to make your own. Uh, Barbara was lucky because even before the war, she and her family had raised chickens in the backyard. And so they were able to share eggs, which were very tightly rationed um, with uh, their neighbors. And another thing that her father shared, he had a rowboat that he took out into La Jolla Bay and he fished and he got shellfish. And so he was able to trade those things with, with his neighbors as well. So everybody at home was impacted by the war efforts as well. Um, and then there was the scrap metal, the paper and the rubber that was recycled in these big scrap yards. In fact, some of the, um, the older properties in the gas lamp quarter had their uh, metal iron balconies ripped off and other decorative items taken off in order to help with the war effort in San Diego. This uh, two man sub came to San Diego in support of the war bond effort. Um, so people were encouraged to give their money in support of the effort uh, of the war. And um, so this one was captured at Pearl Harbor and trucked around the country to support the, the, the drives for donations. Posters were everywhere in public places, in the libraries, in the grocery stores, any place that people would tend to congregate. And one of the things that was very important um, people were trying to encourage was the growth of uh, victory gardens where you could grow their, your own vegetables. This had become popular during World War I and it was a renewed vigor during World War II. So it was very uh, common to see people putting um, vegetables and fruits, planting both in their backyard, in their front yard, any place that they could find some spare land. Um, they were trying to grow uh, vegetables for the war effort and so that the things that they were trying to buy in the grocery stores could instead uh, be shipped off where they were needed at the front. So a, a major effort. Um, and of course, the concern for the um, people in San Diego was very much the war in, in the Western Front, if you will, the war that was happening in the Pacific, in the Philippines, in parts of China. Um, what was going to happen with Japan? People were very much concerned with what was going to happen um, as our men and material were sent across the sea and where were they going to come back and were there going to be uh, raids of the type that were suffered at Pearl Harbor? Um, up at Point Loma, at the top of Point Loma, where one of the lighthouses stands, uh, there was a military radio station that was tied to a military radio station that was down on the shores of Coronado. And so whenever a, a ship attempted to enter San Diego Bay, it was had to go through what were known as two barrage uh, curtains. So there were these two curtains which blocked the opening of the harbor. And each day the code for being able to enter the harbor changed. So this is a very, um, for the time, a very high tech uh, uh, system in order to be sure that only those ships who were intended to come in the harbor would in fact come in the harbor. So this might apply to a ship carrying supplies. It would apply to military. It would also apply to fishing boats. So everybody had to be part of this system. And the, and the uh, barrage curtains uh, were in place to prohibit a submarine sneaking in while the, at the surface these things were open. So this was very, um, very carefully plotted out. And so you radioed as a ship captain or a ship radio operator, you radioed your uh, uh, secret code to one radio station, who then radioed on a different frequency up at the top, who then radioed down again, so that these two curtains could be re removed from across the bay um, so that ships could safely um, be coming into the harbor. So you can imagine this was a, a community that was subject to a lot of tension. There were air raid drills. There were um, notices in the paper. 
there were, you know, you couldn't go out and drive your car at night, not just because you didn't have the gasoline, but because you didn't have the proper kind of um, curtains and cuppings over your headlights so that you weren't shining any lights to indicate to an enemy flyer overhead where the main roads might be. Um, your windows were curtained. You had to be extremely careful about anything that was going on at night to be sure that the enemy was not tipped off in any way um, to where the bulk of the housing was and where the military bases were. So um, it's a community that is a pretty nervous community during um, the entire time of the war. Well, again, we were mostly concerned about what was happening on the, the, the West Coast and the threats that were posed to those countries that were farther away from us. Um, we had planes flying up along the coast of Alaska to try and find Japanese ships that might be coming up uh, across the northern route and then come down the southern coast. So they come across the Bering Sea and then come down the coast of Washington, Oregon and, and California to come down and attack us. So. Uh, our protection was the entire western coast of the United States up into Alaska as well. And so our concern was, was everything that was to the west of us. And so as things were happening in the east, we were, of course, getting news. There were news reels. There were, were the headlines. There was the radio shows. Um, but it was really hard to take those things really seriously because of the fear that was felt about what was happening here in San Diego. And so when Victory in Europe Day happened on May 8, 1945, and um, um, Hitler committed suicide and uh, uh, the German army uh, surrendered, although it was noted here in San Diego, it was not huge because the Japanese were still out there on the other side and there was still, an awful lot of atten uh, tension going on. And so the tension went on through the summer, uh, fear of those ships out there and attacking our ships and what happens to your sailors who are on those ships and what's happened to people who are trying to make way, make some headway against the Japanese on the islands of the Pacific. So that's where the concern was. And so it wasn't until victory in Japan day after the bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki that the people of San Diego really felt that they could breathe a sigh of relief. And boy, did they breathe a sigh of relief. Um, this is VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day at this Horton Plaza Park, and you can barely recognize it. Here is Broadway. Just in the little tiny corner, you can see the Horton Plaza Fountain, which is in the middle of the grassy area of that park. You can see one, two of the tall palm trees that run along Broadway, but this gives you the sense of what the celebration was like. People just pouring into the downtown area any way they could get here to celebrate with each other uh, this tremendous victory at, and that for San Diego, like for the rest of the country, this dreaded war could finally be deemed over. So that is the end of my presentation. And um, I think what I'm going to do is stop my, my screen sharing here and come back to see you as a real person. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions that have come up that, that Sam, you haven't been able to answer. So we have a few in the um, Q&A already. Um, we've got a question about the war effort in Tijuana. Do you have any history of Nazis in Tijuana at this time or later? That's a really good question. Um, and one to which I do not have an immediate answer. As I probably discussed with you all when uh, when I talked about San Diego during World War I, the Germans were very much aware of the proximity of Mexico and San Diego and the military bases. And so during World War I, they had attempted to get the Mexicans to sign up and be part of 
you know, their war against the United States and, uh, and its allies. Um, that uh, I am unaware that, that anything like that happened in World War II. Um, I know that people in Tijuana were also part of the manufacturing of items that were needed for the war effort. And so uh, Tijuana saw a similar increase in population during the war years as did San Diego. Thank you. Um, we've got another question um, specifically about Cottonwood housing in National City. Do you have any information about um, that particular housing development? I do not have information about that particular one. There were a number of smaller properties that were built in, um, there were some in Chula Vista and there were some in uh, National City. They were built as small apartment type houses and they were built to house the war workers. And that's all I know. Of course, National City had um, a number of uh, military uh, naval stations there. Um, they also um, were the sort of the graveyard for the World War I destroyers that had been parked there um, outside the naval facility at National City. So it was a place that uh, where the military was well known. Um, we've got a question about, uh, do you know what the barrage curtains were made of? I believe that they were, I think they were metallic. I, so they had to be, you know, difficult to haul back and forth. They were designed to be able to, to tie up a sub. If a sub tried to go through them, it, that wasn't going to happen if they were closed and secured. Um, do you, can you talk about how much commercial fishing went on during the war? How much continued? Well, commercial fishing, fishing changed significantly during the war because um, one of the major components of the fishing industry was the Japanese fishing community and um, probably making up as much as a third of the fishermen in San Diego. Um, and so when they were taken away in 1942 is when they were finally all removed from San Diego, um, that would have changed fishing significantly. Um, less people doing it, um, less men um, available to do that fishing because they were being called off to the war effort. They were either being drafted or they volunteered for the war effort, or there were maybe better paying jobs in the aircraft plants and other ancillary plants that were making things for the war effort. So I think the fishing industry, although it was very important to the, the food supply for the military. Tuna at that point, they had figured out how to can it in order to preserve it. And so shipping it by boxcar um, back to some of the bases on the East Coast was uh, entirely probable, but um, I think they were uh, kind of hard pressed to catch those fish. Thank you. Um, can you talk about the, you mentioned two trolley stops in Linda Vista, uh, yeah. the two locations of those? Um, I do, I'm sorry, um, if I could call up my map and get a great big magnifying glass, I could tell you, they were in the vicinity of that town center area where they used to have that big dome shaped community center that later became like a roller rink. So it's where the post office is, there are a couple of churches in that. And, and so they were on, I believe, opposite ends of that. Mind you, as far as I know, it was the same trolley. So you could walk to one stop or walk to the other stop, but if the trolley was fill, filled, you had a problem. And many people actually, and this was real popular with kids, by the way, they simply walked to work. They walked down that long Linda Vista Road, crossed over the river, and then went to the plants at Consolidated. As the kids did when they were kids, and they walked down so that they could go fishing in the river and they could go play on the ruins of the San Diego mission and they could go into the businesses up there in Hillcrest and so. Thank you. Um, we've got a question about military activities out in, out in the county, like in Borrego Springs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, there were a number of training facilities sprinkled throughout um, San Diego County. And yes, Borrego Springs was one, and, and that I that it existed is about all I can tell you. I'm sorry, I know it was okay. there. They yeah, they were they were spread out. 
That's, um, I know we've got some resources specifically about uh, different military activities throughout the county in the journal. So if that's something you're interested in, the Journal of San Diego History would be a great resource for you. You can search it um, on our website, sandiegohistory.org. Our little search bar on the top right, put in a, a keyword or a topic and a ton of information will come up for you, a ton of articles. So that might be a good spot for you to check out. And it, just in case you don't find anything that way, uh, the big Brago Springs State Park, which is out there, has a wonderful visitor center and a historical society that helps maintain their history out there. And that would be another place to look. Oh, regarding the, um, the, the nets, uh, Sandy Woodhouse says, um, well, she compliments that you can get Girl Scouts woven into your stories and thanks you for that. Um, <laughs> and the subnets were underwater and metallic. There was a searchlight up on the point to illuminate the harbor opening and there are barrage balloons probably in place also. So a little more information for that. I appreciate the additional information. Um, and what, another question regarding Consolidated, were African-Americans allowed to work at Consolidated? Yes, Afri yes, they did work at Consolidated. Um, not in any great members be numbers because they weren't represented here in San Diego in any great numbers, but yes. Um, and then a question about Japanese Americans um, property. So did Japanese Americans have their property restored? I know that's a big question. That's a really big question. And, and to, to understand that, you need to know that Japanese Americans by law could not own real estate. So they could not own property. So many of the farmers and the, the business people in the gas lamp quarter could not own the businesses in which they were operating. So were their properties restored? No, no. Um, some few, um, were able to put properties in the names of their children who were American born children. And then the state of California changed the law and said, you can't put it in the name of your California born children either. Um, but there was a later court case that helped resolve that. And so some of them were able to get properties back. And there were a few very kindly non-Japanese people who said, don't worry about it. I'm going to watch over your land. I'm going to raise your crops. I'll send you a check for when I harvest them. So there were some very nice people who did help out, but they were a fairly small number. Thank you. Yeah, that's, there's, um, there's a lot to talk about with that question. Yes. Um, we've got, I think this is, let me um, take a look in the chat. I think there's another question uh, regarding if Tijuana was participating in World War II uh, in regard to coordinating with the U.S. Um, for alerts in case of attack through Baja, California. Can you talk well, a little bit about that? Yeah, the only related stories that I've heard um, is just that um, on that first night of December 7th, when the, the authorities went to Consolidated Aircraft and said, you must shut down your plant, and the, the higher up said, we're not doing that, we're building for the war effort, and they were shut down. Um, it was a different response in Tijuana, where there were things that were being built for the war effort, and soldiers simply went into the plant and through the circuit breakers. They didn't ask anybody, they just shut them down. Wow, so a little bit different in the, the method yes. there. Yes. Um, uh, that's all the questions we've got so far. We, we do have a couple more minutes. If anybody does have any questions they want to pop into the Q&A right now or any comments um, or stories, connections that you wanna make in the chat, we're happy to see those. Um, I did share in the chat um, some links and some email addresses, some resources for you. I'm gonna pop it in again. Um, if you are interested in a, giving us a donation for these programs to make sure they continue going on for us, um, checking out our events page for you. If you're interested in our collections and doing some research, there's a link for that. Um, we've also got an email address so you can reach our education department and programs and see what's going on or if you have a question or a comment you wanna share. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a volunteer with the History Center, that email address is in there as well. So oh boy, are you gonna take a breath so I can say something? Yes, please. <laughs> I just wanted to say concerning that coordination question about Tijuana and San Diego, there was most definitely coordination from a standpoint of um, it would have been really silly for San Diego to have a blackout and Tijuana to have all its lights brightly shining and you know the street lights on and everything. There was a blackout in Tijuana as well. That was very well coordinated so that 
uh, Japanese flyers would not be aware that they were even at the west coast of the United States. So, so the blackouts were very coordinated. A couple more things in the chat. I just want to make sure there are not any questions. Oh, some connections with um, that it shared with all panelists and attendees, so people can check this out about parents moving in 1941 and working at Convair. Um, and her mother had to resign when she became pregnant, even though she was working in the office. And they lived in the streetcar court at Indian Laurel Streets. Uh, yes, yeah, streetcars. Um, the older streetcars. Um, in the earlier parts of the war were used as housing. And so there was a huge housing uh, facility in Mission Valley and they had streetcars, they had uh, old travel trailers. Um, they had simply brought in electric lines, water lines, outhouses were created and um, people who couldn't find housing anyplace else would go to Mission Valley and live in those streetcar courts. Wow. Um, there, oh, one more question just popped into the Q&A uh, regarding a camp up in Oceanside. Um, question asker says, her mom said there was a camp in Oceanside that she and her sister used to visit for dances with the sailors. Um, do you know the name of that camp? Uh, I don't know the name of the camp. It might not have been a camp because the various social service organizations around towns, the YMCA, the YWCA, the Knights of Columbus, were having dances and other things to keep the troops occupied. Uh, and so um, uh, it could have you know, not necessarily been a military camp because probably civilians were not so easily led onto the camp, but rather a city park where they were having an activity for the people. Um, Oh, a story just came to mind and flitted right out of my, oh, oh, I know. A story that Barbara Jones, who I've quoted so much, and you guys really need to go to the History Center and read her oral history. It's very interesting. But something that she talked about was how um, when uh, uh, all the mili military started pouring in and they were in their training and finally it was time for them to get a little break, and so up at Camp Callan, which is up near her home in La Jolla, way up by where the Salk Institute is today, Camp Callan sent buses all the way down to San Diego State University to pick up sorority girls who they had recruited to come to the dance at Camp Callan. So then the girls ride the buses all the way back up to Camp Callan. And what they discover is the sorority girls are in their 20s and the sailors or Marines are 18. And so that wasn't going to work out. So the next time they went to La Jolla High School and recruited people to go, women to go to the dances up at the military base. <laughs> I love those stories where it's like, oh, yeah. not quite what you planned for that. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've got one more question. It, it's probably about the last one we're going to take. Um, if you can uh, talk about the, if there's a maximum number of employees at Consolidated during World War II. You know, what the uh, you know, I've heard a lot of figures um, and again, remembering that they're working three shifts a day. So um, I think it was somewhere around 40,000 and that's just a very rough figure. It was a huge number of people. Yeah. And when you think about the drain on the transportation systems to be able just to move that number of people. That's incredible. All right, that is the end of our questions. I don't see any more in the chat. Um, so it looks like we've got all those answered. If you think of something else you didn't get a chance to ask today, feel free to send an email. I can get you into contact with Linda and we can get that question answered. Or you can check out our website and, and do that search we talked about. It'll pull up all sorts of resources for you. Um, Linda, thank you so much for another presentation. Um, and we will hope to see all of you folks next month for our next um, talk. Um, the topic is as yet to be determined. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that in our events page and in your emails. Thank you. You all, bye.